Hello, I'm Dr. Ala Kemmerdiner. Welcome to Descriptive and Simulation. This is Lecture 5, Fundamental Simulation Concepts, where we talk about some basic concepts from probability and statistics that is often used in simulation. Uh, specifically, I will talk about randomness in simulation and process interaction-based simulation. Randomness in simulation is important because most of the systems we will study are dynamic, they change in time, stochastic, uncertainty and variability, and that's where we really need the randomness. And also their discrete time, which means there are some sudden, non-continuous changes. So here's a task for you. Please give at least two real-life examples of uncertainty or variability. Think about it for a second. All right, here's my example. When you hear, on average, for example, on average it takes me about 20 minutes to direct a class, or on average I do about 10 repetitions when I do some weightlifting in a gym, which really is anywhere between 8 and 12. So anytime you hear on average, it's one of the examples of uncertainty or variability. And uncertainty and variability are modeled as randomness using probability and statistics. So here, as you can see, we know that different input leads to different output. So recall that last time when we looked at the simple processing system, we did a hand simulation that was based only on single input. And so we computed the average waiting time in Q and the time average Q length and also utilization of drill press. And we got a single replication. When we did a single replication, it's only a sample size of one, right? It's not much that we can say about this. But if we made more replications, we can do some additional analysis and then we can actually interpret the output better, right? That would allow us to make some useful interpretation of the output. So suppose you made a total of five replications, right? And not just one replication that I showed you in the previous lecture. So here, if you have five replications, you can see in this table, right? There is a um, columns for, there are five columns for replications. Right, so you see in the first row it says replication, and then one, two, three, four, five. So for different replications, we have different values for total production, average waiting time in Q, maximum waiting time in Q, and so on. Right, all those different performance measures, right, that you can see in the first column. Right, in the first column, we list the performance measure. And then in the next five columns, we have the values for that correspond to these performance measures that were computed in different replications, right? So when we average out the replication, replication values, right, for, for example, for total production, we get 3.8 as the average of 5, 3, 6, 2, and 3. That's our sample average. We can also get a sample standard deviation for total production, right? And that's 1.64. And we ha can get also 95% half width. And 95% half width talks about the confidence intervals. But overall, if you look at the total production, you can see that the range is anywhere from the 6 being the largest value of total production that we see in replication 3 to the smallest being 2, right? for the replication 4. So there is quite substantial variability across replications and not just for total production, right? So we could compute the confidence intervals for expected values. And here's a formula you can see there, right? In general, we have the a sample average, which is x bar that you can see there as your formula at the bottom. And you have the x bar plus minus the value of um, t distribution with parameter n minus 1 and 1 minus alpha over 2 multiplied by s, which is the sample standard deviation. So that small s is a sample standard deviation and then divided by square root of n, which is the number of replications. So this is true when we assume normality. 
But how, how valid is this normality assumption? Can we assume it for all of our performance measures? So suppose it's okay for the total production. Then for expected total production, we can get this confidence interval of expected total production, right? And that's for 95% precision, right? That's our precision here. And so we get, when we plug in the formulas, right? In the formulas, we get plug in the simple, simple average, which is X bar. For total production, you can see in the table, right? Right there, under the average, in the first row, the row for total production is 3.8. So that's what we plugged in. And then we plugged in the value of T n minus 1, and n is 5, so it's n at 4, and then again, right, this is 95% um, interval that we are working with. So we got 2.776 as our t value, and then multiply by s, which is a simple standard deviation, which for total production you can see in the table is 1.64, so that's what we got here, and then divided by square root of n, and n is 5 because that's the number of replications, and so we have square root of 5. So that gives us an interval, right? And that interval is at the very end, at the very bottom there, is 3.8 plus minus 2.04. So why do I say it's an interval? Because we have the lower value being 3.8 minus 2.04 and the upper value 3.8 plus 2.04. So now let's review the probability and statistics in simulation. Because in simulation we typically uh, work with random inputs and the random input produces a random output, we need to use probability and statistics to make sense of it. So we will discuss random variables, their distributions and properties, we review stochastic processes and simulation output data, and also estimation of mean and variance. We also talk about confidence interval. Let's discuss randomness. How to use probability to model randomness? Here's a task for you. Give at least two examples of when, under the same conditions, different things happen. Examples. Sometimes you may wake up in the middle of the night once or twice. Other times you don't. Do you know for sure whether you will or won't wake up in the middle of your sleep? Another example. You play a game with one or more people. Do you know who will win? And here is one more example. You apply to several colleges. Do you know which ones will accept you? It is important to discuss likelihood of outcomes. For example, we could have multiple outcomes of the same action. And here's a task for you. For each of your examples for the previous task of when under the same conditions different things happen, tell how likely each outcome is. Examples. You play a game with one or more people. How likely is that you'll win win? It could be that it's 50-50 if all of you um, or both of you are the same in strengths um, and play the game equally well. Or maybe if you're a much stronger player, it could be 90 and 10 percent. Here's another example. You apply to several colleges, say A and B. How likely that only college A will accept you. How likely that both or none will accept? Let's talk about probability. We can enumerate all outcomes of the same action. The likelihood of each outcome is modeled by probability of that outcome. So probability is a function of outcomes with the values between 0 and 1, and each probability value represents certainty or uncertainty about the outcome. In the previous example where we talked about um, the likelihood of winning the game in uh, if you're a stronger player that likelihood for you to win would be 90% versus for you to lose and the other person to win would be 10%. In that case we could represent it through the probabilities as probability of you winning as being 
equal to 0 0.9, which is a value between 0 and 1, and probability of you losing being equal to 0 0.1, which is again a value between 0 and 1. So if we talk about the certainty and uncertainty of the outcome, if we have probability equal to, one, to 0, then we can say that the outcome is extremely unlikely or impossible. On the other hand, a probability equals to 1 if the outcome is certain to happen or, to be more precise, almost certain to happen. And everything else is basically in between, between extremely unlikely or impossible and certain to happen. Let's talk about random events. What is a random event? We have already talked about random events in the simulation, and we actually had a list of the event calendar when we did the simulation by hand of a simple processing system. So now, in here, we learn how to formally define a random event. Collection of outcomes is called a random event. And probability is assigned to random events as a sum of individual probabilities of the outcomes in the collection. For example, you applied to colleges A and B. The all possible outcomes are 1. Both A and B accept you. Outcome 2. Only A accepts. Outcome 3. Only B accepts. Outcome 4, none accepts. So all different possibilities are s summarized in those four outcomes. And what's important is that if outcome 1 happens, such as both A and B accept, then none of the other outcomes, outcome 2, outcome 3, and outcome 4, can happen. And the other way around, if, say, outcome 2 happens, then outcome 1, outcome 3, and outcome 4 cannot happen. If only A accepts that it's impossible that both A and B accepts, or only B accepts, or none accepts. And this is true for any specific outcome, including outcome 3 and 4, right? The other outcomes is just not possible if single outcome happens, right? That's concerning the outcomes. But the, uh, the events are different from the outcomes. The events are actually a collection of outcomes. So some events, based on the, the space of different outcomes, is, for example, first event, both accept. Both accept is just a single outcome, one, right? It's both A and B accept. Here's another event, event two. At least one accepts, but possibly both. Think. What are the outcomes that form this event 2? Yes, you're right. The outcome 2 is formed by three events. It's uh, event 2, only A accepts. Event 3, only B accepts, right? That's just one accepts. And event 1, 2 accepts, right? Both A and B accepts. So that gives us the second event as a sum of those outcomes, outcome 1, 2, and 3. Now let's talk about random variables. Random variables are functions of random events. So a random variable has a probability associated with each of its values. So a regular variable only has values, but the random variables also has a corresponding probability. Example, your parents want you to get into a college. You applied to colleges A and B. Your parents' happiness, call it H, is a function of whether you got in or did not get in and into which college. Say college A is very prestigious, but is unlikely to be accepted. <coughs> so your parents' happiness, H, equals to 1 if you got into A, but because it's a random variable H, it all, we also need a probability value. So the probability of that event is 0 0.1, 10%, right? Say an unlikely event. So 
right? If we just said, well, happiness h equals 1, right, that wouldn't be a random variable unless we also attach the corresponding probability, which is 0 0.1. Great, now that you know what random variables are, let's talk about specific type of random variables, which are discrete random variables. A random variable x is said to be discrete if it can take on at most a countable number of values. And countable basically means a sequence, whether finite or maybe infinite sequence. So we have the different values of random variable x denoted by x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on. In other words, you can enumerate all the values that x can take. And because it's a random variable, we need to have a probability that's associated with it. So the probability that x is equal to a specific value xi is given by the p of xi that's equal to the probability of x that equals to xi for each different value of i, starting with 1, then 2, 3, and so on. More importantly, those pxi's should all sum up to 1. And because these are the probability values, they also have to be between 0 and 1, possibly including 0 and 1. All right, great. So how do we call this Px? Px is called probability mass function. So notice that for discrete random variables, we have probability mass function, or PMF. And PMF gives us a distribution fx of the variable x. So how do we compute this distribution? The distribution function of f, f of x of a random variable x is computed using this formula. And so you can see here we uh, denote the f of x as a probability of x being less or equal than some given value x. And so for discrete uh, random variable x, if you just sum up all different masses, right, or probability corresponding to xi's, where the xi's are less or equal than x. Now let's take a look at this example. So in this example, we have some demand size around the variable, and it's a discrete variable. So it takes on this finite sequence of four values, one, two, three, and four, with the probabilities that correspond to each of the values. So one, six correspond to one, uh, one third probability, one third corresponds to two, uh, probability of three is also one third, and probability of four is one six. So how would we plot a probability mass function for this discrete variable. Well, the probability mass function would be represented here by the four dots, right? Those four dots represent these two values, right? We have a value of one, which would be our horizontal um, or axis, um, or x-axis, and that gives us one. And then another value is a four the um, vertical axis, and the vertical axis gives us px value, which is 1, 6. So for 1, we have 1, 6 as a corresponding horizontal uh, axis value. So we have a point 1, 1, 6. So we can plot it. So notice we just plot this point. So this is the first dot that we get, so the first point. And the second point is for value 2, and you can see that it's at the height of one third, which represents a probability. And then again, for 3, we also have one third, so we also have another point at the height of one third, which corresponds to the probability of one third of 3. And then finally, at 4, the probability of uh, our demand size random variable equal to 4 is 1 6, so we'll get at 4 another dot at um, 4 and 1 6. So notice even though there's these uh, height lines, those vertical lines is not what represents the PMF, the dots are. So the four dots is what represent uh, 
the probability mass function for this discrete random variable. So now that we know how to do the probability mass function, how do we compute or how do we plot the corresponding um, distribution function? The so distribution function f for the same demand size variable with the same values and the same probabilities just as before, right? Because it's the same example. We can plot it using the two axes. So again, the horizontal axis will be x and the vertical axis is now going to be different. It's going to be f of x, right? Because we're plotting the distribution. And so the distribution will be is the sum of all possible values up to a certain value. So as long as our x is smaller than 1, right? Strictly smaller than 1 it's still going to be zero, right? Because we don't have any values of mass, right? Before one. And so that's what we're going to get. So at one, there's a jump. So you can see that dot, right? You can see that empty uh, circles there at one, right? It means that at one, we don't have zero. Instead, we have a jump. And so it jumps and at one, it becomes one six. And that continues to be 1, 6 because we added, we just added that mass of 1, 6. Continues to be 1, 6 all the way till 2 because that's when we get the next value of mass added. And we're adding exactly 1 third because the mass at or probability at uh, 2 is 1 third. So now it jumps to from 1, 6 to 1, 6 plus 1 third. And so that's what we got here, right? And it remains like that until 3. But at 3, it's not 1 6 plus 1 third. Instead, it jumps one more time by another 1 third because we're adding now another mass value of probability at 3. So it's going to be the previous 1 6 plus 1 third plus the new 1 3. And so it remains like that till 4 at which we're going to add another 1, 6, because at 4 we have another mass of 1, 6. And so it becomes 1 and remains like that till the very uh, infinity. All right, great. So now we got this. This is our plot for the distribution function that corresponds to this probability mass function, right? So we have the probability mass function with four masses represented by the dots, and now we plotted the corresponding distribution for the PMF. And notice, each time we have a jump, that's exactly at the same time when we have the new mass on the plot on the left-hand side. So we have all together four jumps which correspond to four different masses at the plot of the PMF. All right, great. Now that we talked about the discrete random variables, I wanted to introduce a different type of random variables called continuous. And we also have mixed discrete continuous variables, um, but we're not going to talk about them in the class, right? There are more. Um, you could learn more about them if you took some probability. But in this class, we're going to focus on the two types, the discrete and continuous random variables. So what are these continuous random variables? A random variable x is said to be continuous if there exists a non-negative, again, non-negative function f x that is called probability density function, or PDF, right? So notice it's not probability mass, it's now probability density function such that for any set B of real numbers, and what kind of sets would we look at? Well, it could be intervals, could be a single interval or multiple intervals together. So the probability of X in the set B of real numbers is equal to the integral of our function FX, which is a PDF, over entire interval or set B, right? dx. And importantly, right, if we integrate over the entire real life, uh, real, sorry, real line, right, over all reals, if we integrate our function fx, dx, we'll get a 1. Which is kind of similar, right, it reminds us that some, some for the 
PMF. The sum of for the PMF is now just replaced with the integral. So in a lot of ways, it's very analogous to the discrete random variables. So PDF gives a distribution fx of continuous random variable x. So how do we compute that? Well, if x is a number and delta x is more than 0, then for continuous random variable x, the probability of x to be between x and x plus delta x it can be computed using this formula, right? Where you can see right, that the probability for x to be between x and some x plus delta x, it would just be integral from x to x plus delta x of our function PDF, right, f y dy. And so, you know, the formula that we, that we learned here, right, so th using this formula, we could actually derive that uh, f of x over there in this example. So now, if we want to plot this continuous random variable, right, so for our exponential random variable with this PDF and this distribution function, these are the plots, right, for PDF, right, on the left-hand side we have a plot for PDF of our random variable, and then the corresponding distribution. So did you notice how it differs from the plots that we had of the probability mass function and the distribution function for the discrete random variable. It's much smoother, right? We don't have any jumps. It's very continuous. Therefore, right, we're talking about continuous random variables. So now let's talk about independence of random variables. It's a very important condition, so we need to know whether the random variables can be assumed independent because it's a very strong assumption. So how do we define the independence of random variables? The random variables x and y are independent. If knowing the value that one takes on tells us nothing about the distribution of the other. Probabilistically, independence of x and y can be expressed in this formula. So here we have probability of the x being equals uh, less or equals than x, and the random variable y being less or equals than the value of y together at the same time, is simply just a product of individual probabilities. So now let's talk about mean or expectation. The mean or expected value of the random variable x is denoted by mu, or e of x. And the mean of discrete a random variable x can be computed using this formula. So notice we have here a summation from uh, where i index i changes from 1 to infinity, which means it can take values 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on all the way to infinity, right? We get x i. It doesn't really take on the infinity, but it takes any possible value, right? Again, it depends on whether we have a sequence that for of values of x that's finite or infinite. Um, so let's say it's an infinite sequence, then this is going to be till infinity. And we're summing up these products of the value xi and its corresponding probability p of xi, right, or mass at xi. So if very analogously, we also have a mean of continuous uh, random variable x, and then just an integral from minus infinity to infinity of x multiplied by its PDF f of x dx. So now let's talk about some properties of expectation. First of all, we have this linear linearity property where if we have a constant c, we can actually take it out of the expectation, right? So the expectation of cx is the same as c multiplied by expectation of x. And here's another linearity property, right? If we have two variables, x and y, random variables, then the expectation of the sum of two random variables, which turns out to also be a random variable, is going to be the sum of the expectations, right? Their respective expectations. And that's regardless of whether x and y are independent. The mean 
is an important measure, and it's a measure of central tendency of a random variable. So here's a task for you. What other measures do you know? Example of measures of central tendency are mode and mean, right? They're also often used as a central tendency of a random variable. Now let's talk about variance. The variance of a random variable x denoted by sigma squared or var x is computed using the expectation. So sigma squared, which is a variance, is the expectation of the difference between x and the expectation of x squared. And the variance is a measure of dispersion of a random variable about its mean. Here's the properties of variance. Uh, compare these with the properties of the mean. If you can uh, compare these two um, different kinds of properties, you can see that in the first property for the variance, we have variance Cx, which is equals to the C squared variance of x. But for expectation, we had expectation of Cx was equals to C multiplied by expectation of x. So there is no linearity in um, terms of the variance. But uh, another important distinction is in the expectation, we could just simply say that the expectation of the sum of variables is the sum of expectations. Well, here we could still say it for the variance, but only and only if x and y are independent. Look at these two uh, figures that we discovered, that we uh, looked at. What are the differences between these two distributions, right? You can see that in for on the left-hand side, we have very large variance versus on the right-hand side, we have very small variance. So now let's talk about standard deviation. The standard deviation is actually a square root of the variance, and it's denoted by sigma, while variance is denoted by sigma squared. And it can be given the most definite of interpretation when x has normal distribution. So notice on the figure 4.7 on the slide we have a density function for the normal distribution was the mean mu and um, variance sigma squared. So if you look at this plot you can see that the way right the way um, this normal curve is it, it really is focused um, most of it, right, the area of 0 0.68 is between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. So you can see that there is definitely um, a good illustration of standard deviation being important measure of dispersion for, for the normal distribution. So let's take a look at the covariance. The covariance of two random variables denoted by cov uh, x and y is computed using this formula that also involves expectations. So it's expectation of the product, of the differences, of the uh, difference between x and expectation of x, and the difference of variable y and the expectation of y. And we can also write it in an alternative way. So the covariance is actually a measure of the linear dependence between x and y. And also you can notice that if we plug in x in this formula, then it actually simplifies to the variance of x. So that covariance of x and x is a variance x. And after we talk about covariance, it's logical to talk about correlated and uncorrelated variables. So here's the definition. Covariance x and y is equal to zero if x and y are uncorrelated. And it's more than zero, then we say that x and y are positively correlated. If covariance x and y is less than zero, then we say that x and y are negatively correlated. Independent random variables are uncorrelated but not the other way around. They're 
if the variables are uncorrelated, it doesn't mean that they are independent. So that's very important to remember. So variance of differences um, can be computed using this formula. So notice again, right, variance of x minus y is the sum of variances x and y minus twice covariance between x and y. And so if x and y are independent, then covariance between them, right, is zero because the independent variables are also uncorrelated. And so covariance is zero. And in that case, the variance of the difference x and y is just simply the sum of variances. If you look at the correlation, the correlation of uh, two random variables x and y can be computed using this formula. And basically, it's just the covariance of x and y divided by the square root of the product of the respective variances. And correlation is another measure of linear dependence, right? It's a little different measure than the covariance, but it also measures linear dependence between the two variables. It is true for any x and y that the correlation is between minus 1 and 1. Right? It's always including, including those values. It's always between minus 1 and 1. And that's easy to verify. So correlation is a measure of linear dependence. And if we assume that y is simply um, a lin linear function of x, so y is ax plus b, where a and b are just some constant numbers, and a doesn't equal 0, then if a is more than 0, then correlation of x and y is 1. And if a is less than 0, then correlation of x is y is more. So now let's take a look at stochastic processes. Let's define them formally. So stochastic process is a collection of similar random variables that are ordered over time and all defined relative to the same experiment. If the collection or the sequence of random variables x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on, then we have a discrete time stochastic process, right? Because we have the sequence. So it happens, the process say to happen at discrete times, so for it's discrete time stochastic process. If the collection is parameterized um, by some parameter t that's um, a real valid, or in this case, you know, more or equals than zero. So it's not just discrete values, but it's a continuous set of uh, uh, real values. And we have x of t and t more or equals than zero. Then we have a continuous time stochastic process. So here are some example of stochastic processes. Let's say we have n sub 1, n sub 2, and so on where an i is the number of parts produced in the i-th hour for some manufacturing system, then this is definitely a discrete time process because it's a sequence of uh, numbers. Similarly, we might have t sub 1, t sub 2, and so on, where ti is the time in the system of the i-th part for a manufacturing system. Then again, this is a discrete time stochastic process because it represents a sequence. On the other hand, we might have Q that depends on T, where T actually ranges from zero on. So we have a continuous uh, interval of time starting with zero. And here, QT, as you might think, is a number of customers in the queue at time t. So this is no longer a discrete time process. Instead, it's a continuous time process. Again, if we have CIs, which are total cost in the i-th months, right? the months are discrete values. So again, if we look at the parameterizing this process, it's going to be C1, C2, and so on, because months are discrete. And so the time is discrete in this case, and we have a sequence. So that's a discrete time stochastic process.
Another example, you might have E sub 1, E sub 2, and so on, where EI are end, EIs are end-to-end -end delays of the ith message to reach its destination in the communications network. So again, right, it's ith message. Messages, again, are discrete, so we parameterize them by the sequence. So again, this is a discrete type at time um, stochastic process. Now, let's talk about estimation of means and variances. Let x1, x2, and so on until xn be IID random variables with population mean mu and variances sigma squared. So what are IID? IID denotes independent and identically distributed. So the first I stands for independent and the second I stands for identically together with the distributed. So it talks about the sequence of a finite sequence of random variables that are all independent with each other and also they have the same distribution with the mean mu and variance sigma. So in that case, right, we can look at some of the sample estimates. We can estimate population parameters, different population parameters. For example, sample mean mu that you can see in the first row. And the sample mean, right, so the population parameter mu is the actual population mean. And then we can estimate it using the sample mean, which is denoted as x bar. And it depends on n, which is the number of samples. In our case, right, also number of this random variables in our finite sequence. Then the x bar of n is simply, right, the average of the values xi. And we can also get the sample variance, right? And sample variance is an estimate for a population parameter sigma squared, which is a population parameter of variance. So we can get a sample variance estimate, and that's given in the formula 3. So there's also alternative, uh, alternatives in terms of um, this, right, for different type of um, populations, right? But this is, if you look at the sample estimate, and it's a large population, and we don't have all the values, then, of course, it's divided by n minus 1. So notice that in formula 3, we actually divide it by n minus 1. And for these estimates, the estimates themselves are random values. So we can actually find the variance of these estimates. Why do you think we are interested in finding the var variance um, of the estimates? The estimates of which are sample mean variance and the variance of sample variance. Because we want to know, right, of how, you know, how dispersed those values could be, right? If you estimate something, how dispersed they can be. So notice that x bar is an unbiased estimator of the population mean mu. And what it means, it means that the expectation of x bar of n is equals to expectation of x or mu. So we can also evaluate the precision of estimator. And again, as I said, right, x um, bar of n, which is a simple mean, is a random variable. And it has its own variance, variance of x bar n. And on one experiment, it may be closer to the mean mu, while on the other in another experiment, it may differ from mu by a large amount. So if we do this, we can look at the sampling distribution of x bar of n, which, as I said, is its own random variable, as a sum of random variables. And so you can see, right, in this figure 4.9, you have two observations of the random variable x bar of n, right, and they can be anywhere right there um, on that line. And so we want to know the sampling distribution of x bar of n. So how precise x bar of n as an estimator of mu is assessed by constructing a confidence interval for mu. So 
some of this stuff that we learned today will be very useful for you as you start working on Labs 3A. Thank you.